In March of 2020, when the coronavirus hit Europe, uh, we were actually touring in Spain, right around here in Galicia, and we had to stop. And after that, it took almost a year and a half until now, actually until two days ago when we met again. And over that time, we were brainstorming, making plans um, about how can we perform and learn this piece that was written for us that we were so excited to, to start uh, uh, putting our hands on and um, we've been in touch a lot uh, through WhatsApp and through Zoom conversations and this is how the idea uh, started of making a movie together about how we work together even long distance coming from three different countries it was obvious that it was impossible to meet anytime soon after March 2020 so we kept busy making these plans and finally now we're here learning this piece and hopefully playing the premiere in October of 2021 in Amsterdam. <laughs> How are you guys? Yeah, hi. Hi. I think the results are going to be a lot better if we rehearse more in advance. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It gives time to yeah. digest and then we come back to it again after Roland maybe you and I could do a kind of overdub, you know, practicing our part together or something like we could, I don't know, maybe it's crazy, maybe it's not practical, but lay down bits of the piece, like just record it and then send it. And then the other person can practice. See you later, Ilona, your hair looks amazing. You too. <laughs> oh no, no, I have to do something yeah, here. Very casual. So Metamorphoses has several Dutch works in our repertoire. We play the trio by Julius Röntgen. We play the trio by Leo Schmidt. And we just had a piece we commissioned, newly written for us in 2020, by the real Dutch heavyweight composer Theo Lovendi. Well, already since the beginning, five years ago, of our trio, we've taken up um, Dutch music very seriously, not as a goal in itself, but just because we found some really interesting gems in the repertoire that were not performed so much. So whereas the Röntgen and the Smit are written in the early 20th century, uh, Röntgen still very romantic, Smit a little bit more uh, avant-garde. Uh, the Theo Luvendi was written in 2020 by a 90-year-old, soon to be 91-year-old Dutch composer. And we're very honored that he wrote this trio metamorph for us especially. The coronavirus, of course, stopped a lot of activities. Well, stopped all the activities, I would say, in the artistical uh, level for completely. But not for us. Uh, and this is really gift uh, uh, for us because in a normal regular uh, life as an artist you can't stop you always go on and on and we had a lot of uh, concerts programmed which were cancelled um, uh, but uh, I think we really uh, used that time for uh, uh, to grow uh, and I hope we can uh, demonstrate it to our public soon in Metamorphosis we have three players, but actually we have five countries. 
that we represent. Jean, our clarinetist, is originally American, uh, but has also British citizenship, lives in Edinburgh. Ilona is a Russian pianist who lives in Spain, and I'm the viola player from the Netherlands. So between those five countries, I don't think there's any country that we play so many pieces from as the Netherlands. Jean. I play clarinet in Metamorphoses, and I was born in Massachusetts, brought up in the United States, and I studied there. And after my education, I got a job uh, before I even finished graduate school, moved to Singapore to play in the orchestra there for seven and a half years. And uh, after I met my husband, I moved to Scotland to take my, hopefully take my career in a different direction. Um, the clarinet is a very versatile instrument. It has the largest dynamic range of the woodwinds. It has the largest um, note range of the woodwinds. And it's a very versatile instrument stylistically. You hear the clarinet in classical music, in jazz music, in klezmer music, in folk music. My name is Ilona Tinchenko, I'm the pianist and uh, I've been born in uh, Crimea. Uh, then later on I studied in Moscow, uh, then in Netherlands and now I'm living in Spain. The trio uh, is a very, very nice chance to express myself. Actually, I, uh, I'm really grateful to the fortune to have this opportunity in my life. Uh, it was an initiative of uh, my manager, Mary Captain. Uh, five years ago, we met uh, with my uh, colleagues uh, to form this trio. And we think that we represent something important. We are, you know, Dutch and American, also British and Russian, also Spanish and. Um, sometimes the world would tell you that, that these people shouldn't get along so well. Well, we want to prove them different. We would like to prove them wrong. The different members of the trio collaborate uh, with their different backgrounds through uh, the way we connect, anyway. I think we connect through, through humor, through kindness, through um, real respect, listening to each other's opinions and really thinking about it. I like to show people our friendship and I like to show people our humor and of course I want people to hear our music and I think if people connect to us as people they will be that much more inclined to want to hear us and connect to our music as well. My name is Roland, I'm uh, the viola player in Metamorphosis and I am Dutch. 
most of my professional life I've been uh, playing in the Rubens Quartet. Quartet, the string quartet I founded back in 2000. We played together for 16 years, which was really like the school of my life and the school of my playing. Well, the viola is a um, bigger cousin of the violin, so to speak. Um, the viola plays a fifth lower and has a voice that is a little bit more mellow, a little bit more, a little closer to the human voice, I would say. Well, coming from a string quartet where the instruments are, are very similar, uh, coming from that perspective, it's really interesting to play in the trio that I'm playing in now, Metamorphosis, because we are three completely different instruments, wind, uh, piano and, and string. You would think how can they even come together and that is a, a very inspiring thing because uh, we can come together in, in, a, in a very special musical way and um, add to something that uh, binds us rather than divides us. I'm here in the city of Edinburgh, Scotland, to talk about the Dutch composer Julius Röntgen. One of the pieces in Metamorphosis' regular repertoire is the trio by Julius Röntgen, written in 1921. His music usually shows strong affinities with his mentor Brahms and also Schumann. One can also hear the influence of one of his closest friends, the Norwegian composer Edvard Grieg. Röntgen was born in Leipzig, Germany, in 1855. He was a pianist, teacher, conductor, and highly prolific composer who came from a family of professional musicians. And his musical training was steeped in the Austro-Germanic Romantic tradition. For personal and complicated reasons during World War I, Julius Röntgen became a naturalized Dutch citizen in 1919. Röntgen did much to elevate Dutch musical life. He co-founded the Amsterdam Conservatory of Music in 1883 and co-founded the Concertgebouw in 1884. He was one of the first to introduce Brahms' music to the Netherlands. One thing Röntgen was known for was how he promoted Dutch folk music and other folk music from around Scandinavia and further afield as well. He felt that Dutch music was either German or French influenced, but not inherently Dutch. And he wanted to do for Dutch music what Grieg had done for Norwegian music. Julius Röntgen has a connection with Edinburgh, in particular with music at Edinburgh University and it involves a close friendship with the well-known professor, Sir Donald Francis Tovey. Tovey and Röntgen became close friends and admirers of each other's work. There were several occasions between 1927 and 1930 when Röntgen traveled to Edinburgh to visit Professor Tovey and hear his own music performed by the Reed Symphony Orchestra. In 1930, Tovey would bestow upon Julius Röntgen an honorary doctorate of music from Edinburgh University making Röntgen the first ever to receive that particular honor. Röntgen, in his laureation ceremony, presented Professor Tovey with the gift of a new work called the Edinburgh Symphony. The trio that we play by Röntgen was written four years before he retired. We know by this point that he started to become influenced by more modern styles of writing. In this trio, the first movement suggests a bit of Dvorak. In the second movement, he makes use of the Swedish folk song. And there is no escaping the strong influence of Grieg throughout. But one even hears hints of the new German school with a nod to Mahler in the second movement and a nod to Wagner in the opening of the third. Tovey wrote a beautiful tribute in the Times newspaper for Röntgen saying, Röntgen's compositions published and unpublished, cover the whole range of music in every art form. They all show consummate mastery in every aspect of technique. Even in the most facile, there is beauty and wit. Each series of works culminates in something that has the uniqueness of a living masterpiece. Uh, Leo Schmidt uh, was born in Amsterdam in uh, 1900. And uh, in uh, 1943, he was murdered in a concentration camp.
So uh, this particular trial was written in 38 when uh, when the uh, Europe was already affected with the uh, uh, Nazism. Uh, so this piece has a lot of darkness and. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, personal suffering, uh, as you can see. But at the same moment, uh, it's such a, uh, such a such a nice influence of French uh, music uh, because um, Schmidt was also studying in Paris, and uh, he was really impressed and very influenced by uh, Ravel and Stravinsky. And we can hear this uh, influence in this trio. Um, and also this piece uh, really has a great impact to the public, I think because, uh, because of having everything in the uh, drama, humor, uh, dance um, and poetry. The trio of Leo Schmidt uh, starts with uh, this theme. He uses here 11 tones, so it's like a reference to the 12 tone system. Uh, the whole trio has a lot of influences and already very soon we see uh, such a change of the harmonies. nearly impressionist. Few French elements appear in this trio now and then, like uh, with the solo of clarinet, with the pedaling which covers uh, the, uh, a few harmonies. There are quite a few uh, French uh, moments which we can uh, enjoy here. Like, for example, this one, which just happens uh, all of a sudden af after a very active and contemporary music. Look. Like, we are nearly back to 19th century to Ravel or Debussy. And such a moment, they don't last long. We are talking about maybe uh, eight bars, and then within uh, another eight bars, uh, we are immediately in the mood of uh, Stravinsky. This mix of stars is very enjoyable and uh, very unexpected. Uh, because Stravinsky and, uh, and French music, of course, they, uh, they all uh, were in Paris, but uh, Schmidt on that time was uh, in the center of, of that cocktail of uh, styles. And that's what we can really see in this work. The wonderful thing about Theo is that his age is completely irrelevant. He's turning 90 this year. He was born in 1930. And when you talk to him on the phone or in person, it's absolutely irrelevant. And you feel like he's, he could be 20 or 40. Hello. Yes, we're all masked. That's the rule here. Let's play a few bars and see how the sound is, okay? See if you can hear us. Oh, 
No, it, it, it sounds terrible. Wat heel bepalend is geweest dat ik in die jaren dat ik vrijwel werkeloos muzikus was, uh, plotseling mijn boezemvriend in de muziek, Natalie Alzak, trompetist, die kreeg een engagement in Turkije en die schreef me een brief, kom maar hier naartoe. En toen heb ik daar voor het eerst echt als professioneel muzikus een aantal maanden gewerkt. Toen heb ik de, de moed gehad om op 25e naar het conservatorium te gaan. Ik heb toenadering gedaan, toenadering samen gedaan. En uh, nou ja, ik werd meteen uh, voor, voor die beide hoofdvakken, kleinet en compositie, werd ik aangenomen. Ik zie mijn uh, kleinet leraar nog uh, opspringen toen ik uh, bij de eerste les bijvak kleinet uh, een paar tonen had spelen. Dat hij vroeg, maar waarom wil je bijvak net? Ik zei, nou ik wil helemaal geen bijvak net, maar uh, ik heb geen geld om twee hoofdvakken te doen. Toen sprong hij op en rende naar de administratie en vanaf dat moment had ik twee hoofdvakken. Wat ook heel erg vormend vond is geweest mijn kennis van de Turkse muziek. Ik heb dat nooit zelf beoefend, dat, dat kan niet door het hele andere toonsysteem. Maar um, uh, uh, daar ben ik natuurlijk helemaal vertrouwd mee geraakt. En uh, ja, dat zijn heel andere toonsafstanden en andere ritmes ook. Uh, die ik al een klein beetje kende via de muziek van Bartok. Want Bartok heeft dus al die ritmes die op de Balkan uh, aanwezig waren, uh, door, vooral door de Turkse overheden, uh, heeft hij gebruikt. Mijn tijdgenoten, die zelfs een paar jaar jonger waren dan ik, zoals de notenkrakers bijvoorbeeld, die, um, uh, die waren allemaal met avant-gardistische technieken bezig. Dus ik had wel het gevoel dat ik eigenlijk ontzettend achterliep. Uh, maar ik kon niet anders. Ik, ik voelde dat zo. En dat is natuurlijk ook wel weer een wijze les die je dan op de duur uit zo'n leven trekt. Dat je moet gewoon toch je eigen gevoel volgen. Ook al heb je het gevoel dat je achterloopt. Maar als je het niet anders kan voelen, dan moet je dat in kunst gewoon doen zoals je het voelt. En dat is het enige wat telt. Dus mijn hele leven daarna is eigenlijk, dus na mijn dertigste, hè, dus, dus behoorlijk laat, is daarna uh, één grote inhaalslag geweest. En ik heb me dus heel geleidelijk ontwikkeld. En dat is aan de hand van mijn composities te zien. Um, en ja, daardoor uh, is bijvoorbeeld zo'n stuk als, als dit trio, ja, dat komt niet uit de lucht vallen. Dat, dat past in een heel logische lijn waarin mijn hele oeuvre dus, uh, zich bewogen heeft. Dus er gingen geruchten dat de jazz spelen. En de, ik ben een keer op het matje geroepen bij de directeur van het conservatorium. Ze zei, ja, er gaan geruchten dat je jazz speelt. Is dat zo? Ik zeg, ja, ja. En ik had dus een smoes bedacht. Ik zei, ja, kijk, ik heb een gezin. Had ik inmiddels. Uh, en uh, ja, ik moet ook wat geld verdienen. Terwijl ik met die jazz nauwelijks iets verdiende. Maar dat was het excuus wat ik had. Waar hij niet, te, niet goed uh, raad op is. Ze zei, nou ja, hou het binnen de beperken. Dat typeert de, de tijd, hè? want nu is dat heel anders. En vandaar dat ik eigenlijk dus, je zou kunnen zeggen, een dubbel leven leid. Ja. Met toch wel, in de latere decennia, accent op het klassieke. We should connect on uh, the last thing we kind of make some connection. I don't know, with the help? 
Het trio kwam bij mij met de vraag, zou je voor onze bezetting iets willen maken? Nou, uh, daar was ik wel toe genegen, want de piano bespeel ik redelijk. Uh, de kleinet is altijd mijn hoofdinstrument geweest in mijn jonge jaren. En ik ben op de jazzgebied ben ik, uh, voornamelijk als saxofonist, hè? De, maar dat is een zeer verwant instrument natuurlijk. En de altviool kende ik natuurlijk ook al, uh, wel redelijk goed uh, door de stukken ook die ik geschreven had voor Isabel van Keulen bijvoorbeeld. En um, dus, uh, ja, dus toen je, het trio mij benaderde, toen zag ik op die gronden, zag ik er wel wat in. In welk had je ze gezien? Uh, toch is het zo, als ik naar dat stuk kijk, of uh, dus hoor eigenlijk innerlijk, dan, uh, dan is het de invloed van bijvoorbeeld Balkanachtige ritmes, zoals Bartok die gebruikt heeft, uh, is duidelijk aanwezig. Uh, je zou zelfs kunnen zeggen dat het begin met die hamer, dat hamerende ritme, uh, uh, dus uh, een beetje op Stravinsky duidt. Uh, op Stravinsky duidt. Het is zo, er zijn componisten die exact opschrijven wat ze willen en dan ook exact dat willen horen wat ze opgeschreven hebben. Een voorbeeld is daar, niet de minste, Ligeti. Ligeti is een geniale componist die tot in de kleinste puntjes alles precies zo opgeschreven. Als de muzici dat helemaal precies doen, dan heb je dat optimale effect. Je hebt andere componisten en daar reken ik mensen als bijvoorbeeld Guus Jansen en mezelf toe, waarbij er een zekere marge is, hoe minutieus ook opgeschreven, uh, het uh, toch uh, een klein beetje variabel is.